Hi, guys. Merry Christmas to you all. That is a tough act to follow. Do me a favor. Let's get together to 1 John near the end of your New Testament, near the end of your Bible. 1 John chapter 1. So when I was growing up, a symbol of joy in our household was a full cup. So for all the festive holiday meals, there would be my mom's tablecloth, the nice one. And there would be family, extended families, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, the nieces, the nephews. And there would be the good dishes and the good glassware. And we were taught that when you filled the glass, it wasn't three quarters full. It wasn't half full. So people wondered, is it half empty or is it half full? You filled it to the rim. This was a symbol. And my mom's eyes would get Big like a satellite dish. Don't spill on the nice tablecloth. <laughs> but there was a symbol there. You see, the fullness of joy is a symbol in that cup. That our lives should be so full of joy, so content, so full of peace and love that it is about to overflow, and ideally it does. And what you discover as you go through this life is that what we are all yearning for is to experience real life. We want to experience real life. We want to have real relationships and we want to know real joy, something that is going to transcend difficulty, something that will transcend challenges, circumstances, difficult conditions, and difficult people. And this year, this Christmas, what we are going to discover together is that Jesus is truly the greatest gift of all because he satisfies all of those longings, all of those yearnings. And today we are going to discover how together. So if you haven't gone there already, let's turn, tap, or scroll, and let's get to 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to read the first four verses out loud, and I'm going to ask you, if you would, to follow along silently. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen, and we bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Father, as we have come to celebrate the birth of your Son, as we have come to hear from you, to learn from you, we pray that you would open our ears to hear, that you would open our eyes to see, that you would open our hearts to receive from you, that we can leave knowing how to experience this fullness of joy. And we commit it to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. So as you're taking notes, and I'd encourage you to, what we're talking about this morning is that Jesus brings joy. That Jesus brings joy. And really the objective that I think God intends for all of us is that we would experience real life, that we would experience real relationships, and that we would experience real joy. Real life, real relationships, and real joy. Now, as we come to 1 John, it'd be helpful just to share with you briefly the context. John is now the last of the apostles, the last of the surviving apostles. He writes this letter in approximately 85 to 95 AD. He's writing to second and third generation Christians who never experienced Jesus when he was alive on this earth. And he's encouraging them about 
the love of Jesus, the life that they can experience with Jesus, the joy and contentment that flows from this life and the assurance of the life which is to come. And uh, as we contemplate that this is actually a book of the Bible, this letter, if we were to distill this whole book to its essence, it would be in these four verses. And John approaches us with this fatherly tone. He's writing with this love for people who never got to walk with Jesus like he did. And so I don't want to be too cute at this holiday. And it's hard when you're my size not to be cute. <laughs> and I put a red sweater on a little man. And <laughs> but I want to implore you with a fatherly tone as you contemplate this. John experienced a lot of pain in his life. He witnessed a lot of sorrow in his 85 years. And yet he's encouraging people that they can experience fullness of joy. And to do that, if it wasn't a potential reality, if it wasn't something that people like you and I could actually appropriate, he would be a very cruel man to tempt us with something that we could never know. It would be like me telling you that when you get home today, there's going to be a Pegasus in your driveway. It's like, wow, you wouldn't even care what color it was. You know, like, wow. But it wouldn't be true. And that would be cruel. But if what John is telling us is something that we can appropriate, something that we can apprehend, something that we could actually experience, then it would behoove us to open our eyes, to open our ears, to open our hearts to receive from God this Christmas what we're truly yearning for. So John begins and he tells us that real life is available. So in the first two verses, we see the word life three times. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar and I'm not going to pretend that I am one, but I want to tell you because this is important for you to know. The word that we translate life is the Greek word zoe. Like if you know somebody named Zoe or Zoe, that is what this word is coming from. And this word means the essence of life, spiritual life. It is contrast with another Greek word, which is bios, which is physical life or biology. And, and so what John's talking to us about is not simply physical life. He's talking to us about this life with God Spiritual life, the essence of what's really important. In other words, you could be leaving today and thinking about what you're going to have for your Christmas Eve meal. And my household, we are going to have Chinese food because we've done that my whole life. And this is what Jewish people do at Christmas Eve. And so whatever you're partaking of will be wonderful. And if you're thinking, this is real life. We're gathered around the table. We're enjoying this meal. We're going to open up presents. We have a tradition at Christmas Eve that everybody gets pajamas or everybody gets to open one gift or we're going to watch Elf or we're going to watch whatever. And that's real life. And I want to encourage you. That there is more to this material world. There's a spiritual realm. And God wants you to partake of this. And only God can give this to you. Now, I assume that many of you in this room are familiar with the children's book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, right? How many of you know this book? Over 50 million copies sold. It's translated in over 60 languages. Familiar? It's a story of a caterpillar who partakes in some really good binge eating. I mean, it's going through all the leafy stuff, and then it starts getting into the chocolate cake, and this is just great. And then when it is full, this caterpillar goes into its cocoon, becomes chrysalis, and comes out what? A beautiful butterfly. Yes, and I have nothing against caterpillars. I think they're amazing. But I would submit to you, at, at the risk of offending any caterpillar lovers in the room, that a butterfly is better. Amen? And so why would you be content to be a caterpillar when God wanted to transform you to be a butterfly? You see, John 
Uh, he knew about this transformation. You see, when John walked with Jesus, he had a reputation of being this angry, quick-tempered dude. And he was nicknamed, along with his brother James, the Sons of Thunder. This sounds like a wrestling tag team, you know, and now the Sons of Thunder. Why? Because when they came to this village and the people didn't receive Jesus immediately, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down thunder from heaven and consume these people right now? Jesus is like, whoa, hold on. We want these people to have a chance to discover just how good God is and to know his love and to receive him. We're not here to quickly judge them. And see, John starts as this quick-tempered guy, angry guy, but through his time being with Jesus, he is transformed. So he has this reputation as the guy that Jesus loved. So John writes about himself, and he calls himself the apostle that Jesus loved. And it sounds like he's saying, he loved me. He was kind of meh about you guys. Or it sounds like he loved me more than he loved you guys. But that's not what he's saying. He's just simply saying, I know that Jesus loved me. And I responded to his love. And I followed him. And it transformed me. So instead of being an angry, quick-tempered person, my life is now characterized by the love of God. That's real life. You see, not only does Jesus offer us this real life, John wants us to know that he can give us this real life because he is God. So at the very start of this book, this letter, John starts in verse 1 and says, that which was from the beginning. He's saying before time existed, Jesus existed. He is not only human, but he is also God. And because he's God, he can give us this life. That's why John starts his gospel and says, in the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he tells us at verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is what we celebrate at Christmas, that God became man, which was amazing, but he also moved into our neighborhood, which is pretty cool. And so John is telling us Jesus can give us real life. Jesus is God. But he also wants us to know that Jesus is man, that he understands our struggles. And so John tells us at verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen, and we bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. He's saying... He, the other apostles, thousands of thousands, tens of thousands of thousands of people encountered Jesus. They heard him. They saw him. They touched him. John is this impeachable eyewitness. He saw all of his humanity, and he saw his glory. He was there in his resurrection. And what he's telling you and I right now is that Jesus became what we are so that we could become what he is as we experience life with him, real life. Jesus is offering us something greater than this life, something greater than the material world. He's offering us real life, and he can because he's God. And because he's man, he knows our struggles. He knows our challenges. As you think back about 2023, I'm assuming that most of us in the room had some good stuff that we can look back. As you, you know, as images show up on your phone, reminders of things in the past, there's some good stuff in there. Amen? And we probably didn't take photos to chronicle the pain. But that's in there too. There was loss, there was conflict. There was tension, there was fear, there was worry. I'm not even talking about the obvious global scale of all of this. 
I'm talking about a very personal, within the walls of where you live, within the walls of where you work, within the walls of where you go to school, within the confines of your community, your neighborhood. There were things that tended to diminish the fullness of joy. Amen? I know it was for me. I, I tell you about it all, but I really don't have time. But I know we can all relate to that. And we know that there's got to be something more than what this life can offer because we're all yearning for it. Amen? So how do we experience this real life? Uh, John's not going to leave us hanging, so let's discover how together. And so we move from real life to real relationship. Look with me at verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So what I want you to see with me is that Jesus offers a real relationship with God. So John uses this word that we translate fellowship twice there in verse 3. What's fellowship? In other words, most of you in your regular conversation aren't using this term. You're not saying to somebody at school, you know, we can have a play day afterwards and have fellowship. Or you're not saying to somebody at work, hey, after work, let's go out and have fellowship. So what's this all about? He's saying we can have fellowship with God. Truly, our fellowship is with God. So the Greek term koinonia, and that's the last Greek term I'm going to share with you. So you got zoe, you got koinonia, you learned something new maybe. So that's the last one we're going to go to today, okay? So koinonia, what is that about? Well, that's talking about community. It's talking about communion, intimacy. It's talking about sharing about sharing life with God, that Jesus offers this life with God. Now, as John would reflect, he could think back about the Psalms. And so many of our Psalms were written by King David. And as David pens Psalm 16, he writes in verse 11, he says this concerning God. He says, in your presence is fullness. Of joy, He's telling us this, this thing that should be apparent to us, but it's somewhat of a mystery, an enigma. He says, the key to experience this fullness of joy is to be in the presence of God. But David would also write Psalm 139, and in Psalm 139, David says, where can I go that you're not there? If I went to outer space, you're there. If I went to the bottom of the ocean, you're there. If I went to the center of the earth, you're there. No matter where I go, you're there. So here's the paradox. Fullness of joy is experienced in the presence of God, and God's everywhere present. So what's the problem? Ah, here's the problem. Perception. You see, um, like my wife Karen, she's a highly sensitive person. That doesn't mean that her feelings get hurt, you know. Over what it means is that uh, light sensitivity, smell sensitivity, odor or aroma sensitivity, depending if it's good or bad. So she will say to me, do you hear that? And I'm, I'm like, I'm like the dog that doesn't hear the frequency. It's like, no, I don't hear that. She's like, it's so annoying. we got to find out where that noise is coming from. It's like, mm, I don't hear it, so I don't think I'm going to help much. She's like, do you smell that? I'm like, mm, no. It's like the curry that we prepared four days ago, and she's still smelling it, and all I'm smelling is the candles that we tried to cover it with. And then there's not only the sound, there's not only the smell, the light. And so she is highly sensitive in terms of her perception. This is the key. There are people in this room who just are really good at perceiving God. You spend time with him. 
You recognize the sound of his voice. When you turn off the screen, when you put your phone away, when you're not being inundated with media, when you're not being overwhelmed with content, and you just have time with God, you hear him speak. You recognize his voice. You pray, and, and you not only make your requests known to God, but you spend enough time just in his presence that you recognize his voice. And as a result, you experience the difficulties in life differently than other people who don't know his presence. So John is encouraging us that we can have a real relationship with God. This isn't a fantasy. It's not your imaginary friend. Real relationship with God. But then he tells us that we can have real relationship with others. Go back to verse 3. That which we have seen, and we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, here's the interesting thing to me. I think this is so curious. Can I share it with you? Yeah, okay, so... Doesn't it seem strange to you that John's saying that you could have fellowship with us before he talks about fellowship that's truly with God? That's the main attraction. In other words, you could have intimate community, intimate communion, intimate relationship with the God of the universe. That seems to me where I'd want to lead with if I was trying to share this with others. But John's telling us something that's curious that we need to consider because it's vital to our understanding. He starts off by saying, you can have community with other people. And that's necessary to community with God. Here, here's the, the, this interesting thing. In other words, um, I believe it is possible to be isolated in a desert or isolated in a cabin and you know, be on an island, so to speak, alone. And you could experience spiritual maturity, possibly. I've just never seen it. I, I imagine it as a concept, it's possible. I've never seen it. Now, here's the thing I need everybody in this room to understand, that this fullness of joy is a byproduct of spiritual maturity. In other words, if, if you leave here this morning, and you're thinking, I'm going for it. You know, God just put on my heart, I want that. And you're going to wake up tomorrow morning, it's going to be Christmas, and you're still going to have bad breath. <laughs> you, you're going to look in the mirror, you're not going to like everything that you see, and, and I don't want you to blame that on me, because that's not what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you that fullness of joy is going to come to you instantly, we live in a microwave culture. We want everything instantly. We go to Starbucks and we see four cars at a drive-thru. It's like, oh, I'm not going to wait that long. Like two minutes, I got things to do. And so we experience life in our culture expecting instant gratification. And we're expecting that from God. And God's offering us this contentment on his terms. And here's the thing. To get to spiritual maturity, which is where this contentment, this fullness of joy flows from, you need others. Here's the thing. You were created for relationship with God, and you experience that relationship with God in relationship with other followers of Jesus. You just need one, but you can have more. In other words, have a handful. Have two handful. Have more of them in your life. But it just takes one. And because we don't do relationship well, because we're not vulnerable and authentic generally in cultivating relationship, because we're afraid of being hurt, afraid of being rejected, Afraid of investing time? What's the return on the investment? Because we don't trust God to do what he's promised to do, we isolate. 51% of people in this country 
are struggling with loneliness. It is an epidemic condition, according to our Surgeon General, and it is not God's plan, and it's keeping us from experiencing contentment. So I have this experiment I'm so eager to try. Can I ask you to join with me in this experiment? Some of you are like, tell me what it is first. Okay, glad to. Let's commit in this coming year to grow in Christ. Let's commit this coming year to be part of a healthy church environment where we show up regularly to worship God, to learn from God, to learn of God together on Sunday mornings. And let's commit to join a smaller group where we can be known and know others. Now, I know that sounds like a challenging proposition. Some of you are like, hey, I showed up to Christmas. I'm showing up to Easter. I'm good. <laughs> but you see, you're ripping yourself off because you can't experience fullness of joy with that kind of rhythm in your life. Jesus is offering us something so much better. Real relationship with God real relationship with others, where we can be accepted in Christ, where we can grow in Christ, where we can help others to grow in Christ, where we can experience this fullness. So, the experiment. Let's commit to do that for a year. And let's come together next year, and if you're doing worse in the contentment, joy area, money back guarantee. Like, 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 Pastor, I did that for a whole year, and now I'm more miserable than I was last year. I just don't believe that's going to happen, but I'm willing to risk it if you are. I'm willing to go there. I'm willing to have you call me out. Are you willing to trust God and take that step of faith? Fourth or excuse me, third, real joy, verse four. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. See, Jesus is offering us a joy that transcends circumstance. Happiness is related to what's happening, our circumstances. Jesus is saying that regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your condition, regardless of people in your life who would tend to diminish your happiness, that you can transcend that as you navigate those challenges. Those challenges are real. They diminish our experience of happiness. But we can have the state of joy. And so John is saying to us, I've written these things to you, and everything I'm about to tell you, I'm telling you so that your joy may be full. And John isn't coming up with this idea originally. He's just repeating what Jesus said. Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. They'd spent three years together. It's a commencement address. It's graduation time. And Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Now, I, I, I tend to trust Jesus. I think he's trustworthy. You know, to come from heaven, to come to this earth, to contemplate the, the teaching of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, the most profound thought that humanity has ever contemplated, to consider his life of selfless sacrifice and the ultimate expression of that on the cross, and then the overwhelming evidence of his resurrection. I, I, I'm convinced that he is trustworthy. And so, what were these things that Jesus was referring to? What had he been talking about? He's talking about his death, that he's going to the cross, because we needed him to be the sacrifice to take the penalty that we deserve. He talked to them about his resurrection. He told them that he's going to heaven to prepare a place for you and for me. And then he talked to them that he would send forth the Holy Spirit so that we wouldn't be orphans. And then he talked to them about his second coming. You know, how many of you have sung joy to the world? 
right? Joys of the World was penned by Isaac Watts, and, and he didn't intend that to be a celebration of the birth of Christ. He wrote a poem, and the lyrics of the poem were put to music. And the poem that Watts wrote was about Psalm 9, verse 8. And it had nothing to do with the birth of Jesus. It had everything to do with the second coming of Jesus. That's where the true joy will be fulfilled. You see, if you knew that you were going to heaven and you knew that it would be perfect and you knew that every struggle that you have to deal with in this life was just going to be temporary and compared to heaven, it would be like a flea on a great dame. You, you couldn't even imagine how small the struggling was going to be compared to the glory that you were going to experience forever with God. If you knew that beyond a shadow of a doubt, then all the struggle that you encountered in this world would be filtered differently through that assurance and nobody could rip you off of joy. And you know what Jesus said was the key to experiencing that? Just hanging out with him. He said, if you abide in me and I abide in you. That's how he starts John 15. And then he tells them, this is going to be the byproduct of it. Your joy is going to be full. The same joy that I have, you're going to have. And nobody will take it away from you. And all you got to do is hang with me. And I think that's an incredible offer, don't you? I mean, that's, that's pretty good incentive. I get everything else that... I am told it's going to be like so wonderful this Christmas. You know, new pans that are nonstick and are going to be amazing and presents and all this amazing food and family that all gets along and there's no conflict and nobody's going to talk about politics and nobody's going to talk about anything upsetting and it's all going to be wonderful. I don't think that's going to really come to be. But I really believe that if I simply connect with Jesus and spend time with Jesus and make him the master passion of my life, that what I'm going to experience is joy. And that's what we're really choosing. It's not the pursuit of happiness. It's the choice of joy. And so I want everybody in the room to have the opportunity. So if I could ask you just to close your eyes and open up your hearts. Father, there are people in this room who don't know you yet. And they're searching. And Lord, you want all of us to know this joy that's available to you. Each and every one of us through you. And I pray that right now, as they just sense that you're tugging on the strings of their heart, they would make that choice right now. And thank you that you've promised to give us spiritual life. You've promised to forgive us of our sin that separates us from you, that you've promised to give us a spiritual birth so we can know this life. And Father, for the many of us who in this past year, we just, we've been distracted. There's so much that's happened, Lord. I pray that you help us find our way back to you and your love, that we would abide with you and know your joy. And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Merry Christmas. Amen.